And here again, we thought dopamine was pleasure. We know it's motivation. We know it's a number of other things. But here it's also released in response to errors that we make, which wake up the brain that it has the opportunity, opportunity to change. And Rick and I were, um, and he gave me no permission to talk about this, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Because <laughs> yeah. um, we decided, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. There are all these meditations. There's love and kindness meditation. There's yoga nidra, non-sleep deep rest. There's even forms of hypnosis out there. But, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could place our brain into particular states to do the things that we want to do? This is my real wish and my real work over the next year or so. And, and so... I don't even think these are meditations, but the, the practice that I encourage you all to try is to, is very brief, is, you know, these days we know we're being bombarded with tons of content. We essentially walk around with little TVs, like little TVs all the time. We're like, what? And then we're like, I don't know why I can't focus. <laughs> we're watching TV <laughs> all the time, you know? Um, and, you know? And, but our brains are very context dependent. The way to think about the way your brain works is that in certain states of mind, you're like a, your, your mind and your focus is like a ball bearing on a flat surface, and it can go anywhere if you tilt that surface. As you get more focused, imagine little dimples in that surface, and it can drop into any one of those dimples. And the thing that we're all seeking is for the ball bearing to drop into a deep trench and be locked there for as long as we want and then out. But typically, it's the other way around. It's we get locked into these states that are either because it, our emotions have been grabbed by something external or because you know we're upset about something and so on and so forth. And it's very hard for us to get that ball bearing down into the trench of the thing that we know we need to do. And so the practice that I've been developing for myself is one in which I acknowledge this. I acknowledge that the world is noisy, my brain is noisy, and I have a practice now of about one to three minutes. And believe it or not, I just scripted it out onto a voice memo. I do believe that when we do it in our own voice, and I encourage you all to do it in your own voice, it's more powerful than listening to someone else's voice. Because after all, it's your voice. And I highly recommend recording three voice memos or four voice memos. The first one is one that you, you tell yourself, there's a lot of noise in my head. There's a lot of noise in the world. And I'm going to gets distance from that noise. And for me, the visual is one thing. I can share it with you, but for you, it might be another where I just imagine the noise moving further and further away. I'm still acknowledging I'm in the world and it's happening, but it's sort of like ripples moving further and further away. After about three minutes, I shift to a different voice memo, which is, this sounds so crazy, but knowing what I know about the brain, I figure it's you know not quite as crazy, which is then I listen to a one to three minute script about focusing, which is really to try and Acknowledge that focus is something that constantly drifts until we're in a flow state. That, we, that focus is a process of redirecting our attention. Redirecting, redirecting, redirecting. I had Alex Honnold on the podcast, right? The guy that we were all terrified to watch free solo up El Cap, probably more than yeah, he was. Yeah. Amazing. It, it's, that's the craziest movie. It, we know he lives like from the first frame of the movie. Yeah. And it's still terrifying. Yes. But, you know, in that state, he's got so much to anchor his mind that I doubt he's pushing away lack of focus. But for most of us, because it's not life or death circumstances, you have to acknowledge that you're constantly pushing away things and you have to refocus, refocus, refocus. It turns out people that are very good at accessing flow states have powerful activation of what's called the no-go pathway. There are two pathways of action in the brain in a, a brain circuitry called the basal ganglia, a number of different brain areas. One is go, like to generate movements or thoughts. The other is no-go, to try and suppress movements or thoughts. Flow states are mainly accessed, mainly, by the no the no-go process. So the more you can shift out of your mind cynicism and try and redirect, for instance, to curiosity, the more you're in a no-go that way, yes, that way. So there's second short script is what I use to visualize focus. And sometimes I actually will think about Alex's climb as a, a, a kind of a, um, the, the pinnacle of an example of focus. And then I'll go into something I really need to do. And now, this might sound silly or overly structured, but I'll tell you what's really silly. What's really silly is that voice in my head saying, hey, you should do this thing. No, I got to do this thing. Oh, wait, there's a text message. And then three hours later, you're a little fatigued and you need lunch. And then you're a little fatigued because you ate lunch. And then the next thing you know, the thing didn't get done. So I'm talking about a one to three minute investment to clear clutter, get distance. That's it. That's it. Get distance from noise. A one to three minute script to acknowledge the focus process and get into And then to do the thing. 
You know, that's thing about that we procrastinate, the thing that we can just avoid until it becomes a deadline or it's terrifying or it's past. Now, here's the real key to plasticity. Those steps are required, but the real key is when you finish out what you're doing, your, your focused work on whatever is most important to you. At some point later that day, you need to reflect on what happened in that work bout. And this is so important. If you remember nothing else that I said, please take this away. We know now based on the neuroplasticity of learning literature and how best to study and that whole mountain of literature that the best way to remember information is to not forget it, which sounds like I'm joking. <laughs> no, it sounds like I'm joking. I know. I, I was like, I have to like get in. How do you not the... forget it? So here's the thing. You self-test. Every bit of learning turns out to be anti-forgetting. And I know it sounds like it's just a twist on words, but here's the experiment that's been done many times now. I give you a passage to read four times or one time or two times. And in some cases, I have you self-test just in your mind for a few minutes later that day. Then I wait three to six months and I come back and I test you on the material. Turns out reading something once and self-testing later and realizing you don't remember it all, but you remember certain things, allows you to remember more inf significantly more information six months later than had you read it four times. So it's the reflection on the thing that we did earlier that locks it in. And I'll give you an example of a ton of sensory exposure with a ton of focus and a ton of attention that you devote every single day and you remember nothing of. If you were to think, okay, last night, you you're probably yesterday, you probably scrolled social media at some point. You didn't think about it afterward. Mm. I mean, do you know how many dog posts I look at? <laughs> and I can, if I think about it now, I'm a little afraid to do this because I don't want to remember the wiener dog sleeping in first class thing that I saw yesterday. And now it's stuck in me, right? But when we were, the whole, the, the re, social media is wonderful. You can learn there, you can connect there. But when we reflect on the thing that we did or that we learned, in particular the errors that we made, you lock in the critical information. You prevent forgetting. It turns out that most information that comes in through our eyes and ears, et cetera, is designed to be discarded, which is why reading something four times doesn't allow you to remember it that well compared to reading it once. Yes, your mind will drift. And then later that day going, okay, what do I remember? Oh, darn, I don't remember that. I remember that piece. Okay, I'm going to go back and look up that piece. So testing is not just something that we should experience of others testing us. Self-testing on knowledge or skill, or this could be physical skill, musical skill, could be relational interaction. I mean, how many people after like couples therapy take a walk by themselves and go, yeah, like what did I really learn? In <laughs> you know, and maybe, maybe, maybe that's why I should do more <laughs> of it. Um, who knows? But the point is that we don't do this. We tend to think that the experience is the experience. The learning was the learning. And it turns out you can learn so much faster. You can learn so much more durably. And there's a terrible instance in life where we know this works, which is in the case of trauma and things we don't want to think about later. The replay later is critical. Mm. Replay later is critical. And so if it's not happening automatically, as is often the case, you need to do that for yourself. And then the, the sort of fourth, so I have a one to three minute script, which reminds me of this. It says, you know, like Andrew, the, the data all tell you that, I, and I already know it, but it's useful to have a practice. This is why, I, dare I say, we, we, we sort of coined the word protocols, even though it existed before, because in, in laboratories, you would say, what's the protocol to stain these cells for dopamine or something? So protocols to me make sense because as a word, because it's supposed to be a list of things that you do that work the first time and every time to get you someplace. And so it's, it, it's critical that we acknowledge that our brains are just not good at doing all the steps without a little bit of self-guidance. Then the question becomes, what self-guidance? Then the question becomes, well, how can that self-guidance be weaved into my day in a way that's seamless and easy and quick and doesn't cost anything? Mm -hmm. And I'm giving you some examples of these. So this is simply what I've been doing and I've found to be very useful. Um, and, you know, neuroplasticity does exist across the lifespan, but, you know, in a kind of, uh, you know, acknowledgement of a reality, it's harder to learn now than it was in my 20s. Um, but I think with these practices, I find that it's not that much harder. And all the data tell us that our brains are plastic throughout our entire lifespan. So I encourage you to think about these not as uh, meditations. Uh, the word that comes to mind 
uh, is sort of activations. Thank you for watching this video. If you want more inspiring clips like this, make sure to click right here to subscribe and click right here to watch that next video that is specific to support you in your life.